we love you men. We love you. We're so grateful that you're here today. Uh, God is using each one of you uh, to do a great work in our city. And uh, the whole nation has heard about what God is doing through your life, through our churches. And so we're so thankful that you're here today. I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Carter. He's going to guide us. We're going to do a little teaching together. But uh, we wanted to go ahead and dive in, maximize our time. All right. All right. Well, again, it's a joy for us to uh, join together, and uh, we, we are incredibly excited about what God has in store for us. It's always fun to come together, and we've been together for now about two years now. For two years now, uh, what started, of course, as a friendship between myself and Pastor Warren, and, uh, and then from there, um, we, we got challenged. It was two years ago uh, when, when the Ferguson-Michael um, Brown issue began to erupt in our, our city, uh, which is one of the, not long after the the Trayvon Martin issue. And so we began to talk, and the question was, okay, what happens when that when that comes to Dallas? What happens when that comes to Dallas? And so out of that, we've been cultivating this relationship. Uh, Pastor Jeff and I have been gathering with pastors around round tables, having conversations about race, having conversations about uh, what's the church's role in this space, having conversations about the racial climate in our country, and how does the church respond to that? And so it's been two years that we've been talking talking and connecting. And then as many of you know, our church has swapped uh, a year ago, and uh, it, was, it was both our serif and Park Cities. And then March of this past, of this, earlier this year, 18 churches swapped on the same Sunday. And so we're grateful to God for what God continues to do. Amen. 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 <laughs> I'm so grateful to your pastor for his heart uh, for the city, for his heart for honoring the Lord, and for this relationship, this friendship uh, that we pray uh, helps our city and even helps the country to continue to build bridges in this important season in which we live. And so out of that, uh, when, 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 the, when the terrible tragedy happened here in Dallas on July the 7th, uh, when the lives of five, five officers were taken, uh, it also allowed us to help lead our city through that process. And so we've been We've, since that time, we've been meeting with, with pastors and meeting with business leaders just talking about, okay, how, how do we bring healing? What, what does it look like? And so this is one of, the, one of the steps in that process. It's actually one of your members and one of my members got together and said, why don't we spend a couple of weeks together in the Word together? We've done these sessions, one here, one there. But what would happen if we committed three weeks together to really talk about these matters of race, but at the same time also to begin to develop some clear action steps? And so that's, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. And so I want to tell you, thank you. You could be a lot of places on a Saturday morning at 7 a.m. in the morning. You could be in the bed sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. You could be uh, on the golf course. You could be somewhere with a fishing rod in your hand. There's a whole lot of places you could be at 7 a.m. in the morning. But I want to tell you, thank you so much for sacrificing your morning to help us uh, to do what we feel like God has called us to do. All right? So it's very important also that you give us these next three weeks. All right? Give us these next three weeks. I know you have a lot going on, but we believe these next three weeks are going to be very, very critical to what we believe God doing in the life of our church, even in our city. And so my, myself and uh, Pastor Jeff, we're going to be swapping the teaching and preaching, but we're excited for this beginning. On your, on your tables, there's a little handout. If you can grab hold of that, uh, it, it's, it's going to kind of walk you through that we're going to be together for these three weeks. Today, we'll, we'll kind of just focus on getting started, okay? Getting started. We're going to get started, talk about finding common ground, and, and talk about some introductory matters. Next week, we're going to talk about a history of racism in America, all right? And Jeff is going to be teaching that lesson and talking about just the history and flow of, of race in the country. And then the following week, I'm going to teach and talk about justice demands action, talk about how we can um, be a part, what, what are some solutions that we all can be engaged in? And so I want to, that's where we'll go. And so you see the purposes there of what we're trying to accomplish. We just believe that these three weeks can be very critical to what we're asking God to do when it comes to um, healing and restoration and reconciliation, both in our city and our families and in our um, in our country. And so we're grateful for that. All right. And so with that, I um, now want to pass it over to my buddy Jeff, Pastor Jeff, and he will kind of get us started uh, with this first key principle in point. All right. Thank you so much, Brian. Okay, let's do this. Uh, grab your hand out there, and you'll see uh, this verse, kind of a thematic verse throughout the series, Micah 6, 8. Now, if you were here at Park City's last week, 
uh, we preach this particular text and some of what we're going to do, in, in fact, the way that we've outlined the next three weeks uh, is built around this uh, particular verse. So let's all say it together, Mike, Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. I tell you, that's a beautiful thing from where we're sitting, isn't it, Brian? To look out and see these men, it is a beautiful thing. And to hear you proclaim the Word of God, the truth of God. So that what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to flip this verse back around because uh, we discovered that there is actually a pathway uh, to peace as you look at this passage. Everybody's wondering, uh, what do we do? And we know this. The educators are struggling to know what to do. The politicians don't know what to do. Uh, we're finding that, that uh, the sociologists don't know what to do. The economists don't know what to do. But we know that the Word of God teaches us how to bring about reconciliation. The Word of God teaches us that we, we are uh, one in Christ primarily. But all this is going to point us to the gospel. And when, our, when we have gospel identity as men, as women, boys and girls, then that trumps all things about us. And we find ourselves in unity because of Christ in us, right? It's amazing that uh, we are so sinful as, as people that we can look at another person and immediately make a judgment about them based on the amount of melanin in their skin, the percentage of a pigment in skin. And this is what we do. Uh, you know, uh, scientists tell us that there is only one human race. I mean, we've talked about how we start there. We're going to talk a little bit more about this next week. But we are human at the core, created in God's image, every one of us. There's not, there, there are not, uh, you know, certain, um, certain aspects of a black man's DNA that is different than a white man's. We are 99.9% .9 the same. There's no cluster of, uh, of, of DNA or, or something that's specific to a certain race. We're all human. We're all the same. And if we can start there, that's a good place to start. But here's our theme for the next uh, few weeks. First of all, empathy is the pathway to peace. Look at this. You'll see it and you can fill, fill out your, um, your sheet there as you just follow along with us. Empathy is the ability to understand. Okay, write that down. Understand and share the feelings of another. It's the capacity to place oneself in another person's position to feel what they feel. Now, this takes a lot of understanding. So this is why when you flip this verse around, the first step is to walk with humility. We come around these tables this morning. We come into these conversations with humility. Humility, humility doesn't say, hey, here I am. Humility steps to the table and says, ah, there you are. Tell me what you know. I want to get to know you. So I want you to turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 19. I'm going to get there in just a moment. While you're turning there, I want to say this. Before we can get to empathy, I would say knowledge is key because it leads to empathy. You have to know some things before you can empathize with another. So we're going to drop some knowledge on you today, next week, and the next. As Pastor Carter said, our hope is, as we've met before and had conversations, our hope in the end, and this is why we're doing it three weeks, not just today, but the next two weeks to follow, is because in the end, we're going to move towards that final piece, which is do justice. Notice you've got to do something. There's something to do. It's one thing to sit around and talk. That's a great thing. But we're, our hope is to take this to a new level where we enter into conversations about real, uh, real things that we can do as men. And we believe as we come together, we can set not only a model for the city, but we can actually bring about some change in our city. So first, we've got to know some things. Look at the next, next step here. The best way to understand one another is to have conversations. You know that. That's what we're going to do today. You're going to have a lot of time this morning, in fact, before we leave, to have a time together. Now, you're listening with an ear towards conversation here in just a moment. You're going to find that you have some questions in the middle of your table. But I want you to be writing down, taking some notes, thoughts that are coming your way, because you're going to be asked about some of the things we're talking about. So listening is an act of grace. Look at what James 1.19 says. James 1.19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear. Everybody say quick to hear. Quick to, quick hear. to hear and what? Slow to speak and slow to anger. 
Now, this, this is exactly what we see in our presidential debates, right? They model this for us. Um, not even. Uh, instead, see, Jesus, the gospel, uh, the, the scriptures always show us another way, right? We either want to, we, we, we've said it here, we either fight or flight. One of two ways people approach conversations that are difficult like this. We're going to either fight or we're going to run. We've determined Jesus shows us a third way. The third way is to engage with humility that leads to kindness, that leads to justice. And so we're going to listen. We're going to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Not until you listen, do you understand. And by the way, for all of you men who are married, I know we got a lot of single men here, uh, take this with you. Apply it today. All right? Quick to hear. Slow to speak. Listening to your wife is an act of grace. All right? Instead, your wife's talking, and what's going on in your mind, I know what you're thinking. Get to the point. Get to the point. Listen, listen. That is the point. Validation of her feelings as she speaks, that is the point. That may have just saved somebody's marriage right there. Man, that wasn't even in my notes, and you just saved the marriage. Praise the Lord. Okay, so understanding one another is critical to reconciliation. Write that down. Understanding. Understanding the history of racism in America is critical for white and black Americans. Now, we know that our black brothers know the history better. In fact, I call it a cultural memory. This is why, listen, so many of us watch the news, and I'm just going to, let's get real. We can get real, right? right. We're going right. to we're gonna, we're gonna get real. Now, Pastor Carter and I have these conversations all the time, but we want you to have these conversations. See, what happens is a white man watches on the news. Terrence Crutcher gets shot in Tulsa, and the white man immediately runs to, hmm, I wonder what's up. I wonder what the facts are. I wonder, I wonder what, wait, he must be high on something. He might, you know, or in Charlotte, my hometown. Uh, we saw the, 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 the man that was, that was shot, and, and first of all, they said, well, he had a, he's just reading a book, just had a book, right? And then later, we discovered, no, no, I think he had a gun. And, and so we, everybody wants to know the facts, but the Terrence Crutcher case, he had no gun. Uh, but immediately what happens is the black community responds, reacts to say, uh-oh, there we go again, even before the facts are out. And the white man is like, no, 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 hold on. Let's wait for the facts. And now we could all say, yeah, okay, I agree with a lot of that. But why is there such a different response? Because there's a cultural memory. You see, when, when you grow up in America, I have no idea what it's like to grow up, to be a, to be a black boy growing up in America. Or in my, my lifetime, in the 60s and 70s, growing up as a black, black boy. Uh, Pastor Carter knows what it's like. If I talk to him, I can learn what it's like. And you see the difference. Everybody wonders, why do we respond so differently? And why, is, why the protest? Why, why, why the... And, and, and Dr. King's the one who said, a protest does not suddenly exist out of thin air. A protest is a response. He said a protest is the voice of the unheard. There's a story there. And we need to understand that to empathize as white men in particular and black men, but for white men to empathize is to enter in and to recognize the story that's going on. So look at this next one. Racism is our country's original sin. Jim Wallace in his book, America's Original Sin, uh, talks about this, wrote it, I think last year it came out, great book. And it has been the backdrop of public policy, Jim Crow laws, uh, voting rights, our lack of, our lack, or lack thereof, law enforcement, civil rights, we're going to be talking about some of these things, education, politics, or our judicial system, criminal justice system, and economics. Now, I know that Pastor Carter is going to be preaching on uh, this tomorrow a bit, judicial system, uh, criminal justice system. Um, I received an email, again, let's get real, I preached last week on race, justice, and equality, and uh, received a, an email from one of our brothers, well-intentioned, uh, who, who said, hey, hey, Jeff, listen, appreciate what you said, uh, great stuff. Stuff. However, why is it that in many of our larger urban cities, we've got maybe a 20% or so, I'm going to give or take, 20% population of, of, of the black, uh, black male and some 80% of the, the crimes, even violent crimes, are committed by a smaller number? He says, come on. I mean, you've you you got you to realize there, there's something going on there. And I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're proving my point. 
there's a, there's a reason that that's happening, and we've got to get underneath the reasons as to why that's the case. There's a systemic problem. It's not that, that black men are, are, are less moral than white men or the other way around. Somehow, we're all sinners. We know this. We're all sinners saved by grace. And yet, we've got to understand the issues. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to take it to a higher, deeper level to understand the issues and how we can be a part of the solution. Now, again, in the black community, uh, you guys are talking about this all the time. And if we're not careful because of lack of understanding, the white, the white men can remove themselves in essence and not be a part of the solution. And so what we've said is we're going we're gonna to learn. We want knowledge that leads to empathy. And this is, the, this is the thing. As Christ is guiding our lives, the Holy Spirit in us, the kind of knowledge that we're going to learn will always lead to empathy. Because we've been saved by grace, we extend grace to others. Now, you know, when we think about uh, voting rights, for instance, 15th Amendment, uh, a black man couldn't vote till 1870. And you might think, well, that's a long time ago. Nope. You need to understand the Jim Crow laws, right? States, particularly in the South, uh, they had their own laws. This is still a challenge, even in our day, for black men uh, to be able to vote. There were so many, so many uh, laws against such. So then look at this next one. Knowledge leads to understanding. Understanding leads to empathy. Empathy leads to grace. And grace leads to reconciliation, which leads to real change. I've said it this way. A gospel-centered church or organization is going to be marked by inclusion. You can see the pattern there. Because, see, everybody's welcome when, when, when grace is preached. When grace is evident in your life, people feel welcome. So grace leads to inclusion. Everybody's included at the feet of the cross. You've heard that. Um, and then inclusion leads to diversity, right? If everybody's welcome, think about it. Logically, you're going to have diversity. So the more diverse your group or your, your friendships or your, even your church uh, to, to some degree, the more diverse, the more you realize grace is taking root. And that leads to one of two things I've seen in the church or in any organization. It leads to either celebration or conflict. And, and if it leads to celebration, then you know that you are a grace-centered, gospel-centered church. That makes sense? And so that's where we're, where we're seeking to lead our churches, to lead us. And the final piece here before Pastor Carter takes it is how is racism America's original sin? We're going to talk about this and the implications of it as we come together next week. Uh, this is a Christian issue is how I'd close. It's why we're here today. It's a church issue. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You know, after we had a couple of shootings uh, in recent days, I'm thinking of the Terrence Crutcher uh, shooting in Tulsa, the shooting in Charlotte. We started to see protests yet again. It seems like, doesn't it, almost every week and through the summer, it seemed that way. Well, because of my knowledge, friendship with Pastor Carter, and empathy that the Lord had led me to, then to love kindness and to do justice, um, I was led at times just to call him. And I mean through just tears, just to call him knowing what he and his church family was feeling more so confessionally than, than a lot of white folks who watch and see what's happening. See, the black man sees a pattern of racial injustice and the white man is not always as empathetic as he should be. Instead of running quick to the facts, what's the facts? What's the facts of the case? What are the facts of the case? Let's hold up. Instead, we should run immediately to someone just died. Someone just lost a brother. Someone just lost a father, a son. You see, instead we should, that, that's why this is a church issue. When one member suffers, we all suffer. And that's why we're here together. When one rejoices, all rejoice. All right, Pastor. Thank you, Jeff. That was great. Um, this is, as Jeff has said, the, the pathway is through empathy. It takes empathy. It takes stepping into one another's shoes, living in one another's experience, asking questions, seeking uh, to understand that experience. But at the same time, this next principle, number two, is this, that the truth will set you free. The truth, the truth will set you free. It's John 8, verses 31 and 36, where it reads this way. Uh, John 8, 31, 36. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word and you are truly my disciples, you will know the truth 
and the truth will set you free. They answered, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. Ultimately, it's the truth, the truth of Christ that sets us free, uh, that gives us a, a freedom to be able to live this out. It's, it's the truth that's found in Christ that, that we truly understand. It's, the truth revolves around several things. First of all, the truth of God's love is for you is that Christ will set you free from sin and give us the capacity to love. As he mentioned before, racism in the, is this ugly, um, terrible issue that, that although it may be be not as overt in the past, it is very subtly a part of our culture and a part of our lives. And the only way to really address it is through the truth of Christ. It's, it's the truth of Christ and the love of God in our hearts. The truth is that we are all sinners. We're all sinners fallen, but it's through a relationship with Jesus Christ that we gain the capacity to love and have a relationship. There's no other way. It is, it is that truth that allows us. It was the, the love of God that when Jeff and I were in Charleston, earlier this year for the anniversary of the Charleston shooting, that massacre in that church, where this young man, Dylan Roof, comes in and takes the lives of these family members. We were there for the anniversary, and we, we heard the, uh, the survivor, uh, the sister of one of the individuals that were killed, as she spoke about forgiveness, as she spoke about the love of God in her life. And what we begin to understand is that it's the truth of God's love that although Studies show that this young man wanted to cause a race war. What he got instead was the people of God showing forgiveness, showing love, and coming together in unusual ways. It's, that is the truth, that there is a love of God that exists in our heart that allows us to build bridges more than just burn bridges. When you consider the civil rights movement of the 60s and the, and the work that took place there, the, the, the engine behind that was the love of Christ in their hearts. The scriptures speak to it profoundly. Romans 12, 9 said, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Mark 12, 31 says, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. 1 John 4, 7 says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for another. It is the love of God in our lives that really is being called out in this season. In this season where we watch the shootings, in this season where we see these ongoing issues and tensions, what's really happened is that God is saying to literally the, the Christian church, he's saying to the church, the church, how will you respond? Will you allow the love of God that's in you to, to, to be exercised in intentional acts of sacrifice? That's what today is about. That's what the next three weeks is about. It's about conversations because conversations are an important part of that. It's an important part of that. One of the reasons that, that America's had its ongoing challenge with race is that we never talk about it. We, we just say, well, it's, it's fine. I don't see anything. It's fine. We just, we go on about our lives and often we overlook it until something bad happens. Then we say, well, what, what caused of that. What we don't understand is that there are there is there, there is a undercurrent of sometimes of racial tensions and, and, and institutional racism that, that, that undergirds many of the issues that we see in our culture. And so it takes these kind of conversations. It takes this kind of ownership of our own issues and struggles. It takes the kind of humility. But then it also takes engagement. It takes acts of service. It takes being engaged around these issues. And so we'll, we'll talk about later on in our time together, what are some intentional things that have to happen? That we can't just go about our lives and think that racism and racial tensions and racial issues will be addressed automatically. No. They don't, they don't just happen by osmosis. They don't just happen organically. No. Whenever there is sin, sin has to be engaged. It has to be, has to be faced. Because if it's not faced, it only grows more and more against, uh, more and more underneath the surface. Not only that, but this love that we're talking about means I've got to influence my peers and those around me. You know, the Christian life is not meant to be led in a, in a, in under, a, under a cover or under a cup. You don't, you don't light something and then cover it up. 
But, but, but it is important for each of us to work to try to influence whatever the sphere of influence I'm in, whether it's the business community or the law community or whatever the space God has called me into. It's not for me to just exist in that space and do whatever I can to protect my own needs, but to understand God has placed me there in that space to influence the culture in a much, much broader way. It is this, this love of Christ. This is part of it. The, the next principle on your sheet says this, more than a race problem, we have a sin problem. More than a race problem, we have a sin problem. It's not a skin problem, it's a sin problem. More than a race problem, we have a sin problem. It's not a skin problem, it's a, it's a sin problem. Mm -hmm. And this is why the gospel of Jesus is, so, is the ultimate solution. As, 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 as Jeff mentioned, that, that part of the issue is that everybody's looking for a solution. I've mentioned it before, but they did a survey trying to figure out they ask a number of questions. They ask, first of all, uh, do, you, what, what's your, do you think that your children, what's your greatest aspiration around the issues of race in the city of Dallas? In that survey, their, their, their vision was that their children would have a better relationship, a better connection, a better uh, relationship with others than they had. They, that was their prayer. That was the goal. But then they asked another subsequent question in the same survey, who do they envision is responsible for this? So then they listed law enforcement, they listed the government, they listed all of these entities, and on down the line, probably like number eight or nine, the church was listed. Then you and I both know that law enforcement is not going to bring about racial reconciliation. You and I both know you can't put it in a book and teach it in class in elementary school and think that it's going to bring about racial reconciliation. You don't understand that, 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 that no one is as qualified as the people of faith are, that we, we are uniquely qualified to deal with these matters of race like no one else can, because the gospel is the real solution. That is, that is the real solution. And so, and so you have this matter of us understanding our unique role. That is, as, as was mentioned before, when we, when we see the things happening, when we watch what's happening in, in our culture, we must understand that racism is not just, when you watch what happens on TV with a, with a, with a riot, or when you watch what happens on TV with a young man that's, that's shot, and although there are multiples of facts that need to be traced, sure they're facts, but you must understand that that racism, that, 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 that incident, People are not upset in the African-American community about that incident. What they're upset is about all the stuff that happened before the incident. Mm -hmm. What they're upset about is that uh, in, our, in our country, we have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the people that are incarcerated mm -hmm. are in this world. We have a mass incarceration problem. And in that same space, one in 17 white men will be incarcerated in their lives, while one in three African-American men will be incarcerated in their lives. When you deal with the fact and the reality of a system that, uh, that where you have limited opportunities and poor educations mm -hmm. that often lead to limited life experiences that often end up leading to incarceration, mm -hmm. and so you wonder what's, what's going on. There, there, are, there have been long-term systemic issues. We've only been voting for about 50 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been 50 years since, those, since the Civil Rights Act of 1965. And so you're, you're dealing with issues that are, that, are not, that are not just new, but long-term issues. Mm -hmm. And these issues that, that cause every black and brown man to walk in a store and feel like he's not welcome, mm -hmm. to be followed by security, to get pulled over for no reason, to feel like he's not qualified, to have to be twice as good as anybody else to be able to get eligible and get mm -hmm. considered for promotions. It's, it's, an, it's a systemic issue that follows us. Mm -hmm. And because of those issues, that's what you see when you see those issues going on. Mm -hmm. The issues are, well, there it goes again. Will we ever get past this? Yeah, there may be some other facts around the matter, sure. But at the end of the day, systemically, it seems like things are bent against us. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I commend you. I commend you for being open to conversations. Mm -hmm. I commend you for being open to at least talk through this. Can I be honest and say, some of this is uncomfortable to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some of this is stuff that, that for some would say, hey, I, I thought we were, were past these things. And we got to be careful about thinking we're past things mm -hmm. just because we're not talking about it. Right, right. But the truth of the matter is that things can be beat, but just beneath the surface and be just as tragically and 
cancerous to our souls as anything that was on the outside. And so that's what we're gathering these three weeks to, to begin some conversations, to begin to allow you to share your story, share your path, to, for you, to begin for you to allow to share what you see God doing in this space. And what, is, what are all these racial tensions really about or, or what, how does the church respond? So this is, this is just a start. Today, you'll, 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 we want to ask you to stay in your same groups for a couple of the next three weeks, if you will. And let's just see what God does. One, by us having these candid conversations, courageous conversations. This is a safe place, all right? It's a safe place, mm -hmm. safe place, all right? So for you to say whatever you need to say, all right? Yeah, sometimes we get in places and we're like, man, I don't know if I can say this. It's okay. You, you, nobody, we, we all, we, we, this is a safe place. This is common ground, all right? The safe place. Everybody say safe place. Safe place. It's safe place, all right? You need some safe places because sometimes Jeff's like, man, can I say this? I said, come on, man. Say whatever you got to say. Huh? Let's work through it, man. Let's work through it. I'm not afraid. You're not afraid. Let's talk through this, man, because if we don't talk and ask questions and dive in, we never get to a healthier place, all right? So this is a safe place for you to talk, for you to exchange, but let's remember what he said more than anything else. He, he gave us a word that I think ought to shape our conversation. Conversations. It's that text in James 1, but it also says to use humility. Yeah. Humility means I don't come to you saying I got all the answers. Right. Humility says I need you as much as you need me. Humility says let's, let's work together rather than working against each other. All right? So we're ready to dive in. We got some qu At the center of your table, there's a little placard there, and there are some, some questions there for your consideration. All right? There, there are five questions. We hope you get time to work through those five questions. We're going to give you about 40 minutes, okay, about 40 minutes. So make sure that, uh, that everyone gets a chance to talk, and uh, let's try to be engaged around these four questions, and uh, we'll get started, all right? So here's the most important time. Begin hey. your time with a and uh, listen, when you're done, um, or about 40 minutes, and we'll, we'll, we'll bring a close to the time, because we want to pray together as we close our time together. So let's jump in. Let the Lord move. All right, all right. Well, great, great, great. Again, it's been a great first session. We'll see the guys together for the next couple of weeks. We'll be sharing the teaching these next couple of weeks. And uh, it's been really, really, I had a great time at my table. We had some great, great discussion. I hope you had the same. It's only just the beginning. It's only just, just the beginning as we continue to build these relationships. I'm going to close us in prayer in just a minute. And once I close us in prayer, it's okay. It's okay. Once I, once I close us uh, in prayer, um, if you don't mind, if, you, if someone at the table, I want y'all to take a, a group pic at the table and post that. Use that on social media. There's so much negativity going around. Mm. We think what God is doing in our, our lives this season, we want to spread some positive good news, all right? Yeah. So if you don't mind, if you're on social media at your table, take, get the guys got to take a quick pitch and post something positive with the conversation. We're beginning a new start, coming together. I think it's so, so important that we realize the church plays a key role in this piece, all right? Let's pray. Why don't we stand? Catch your brother's hand, and we'll go to God together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to tell you thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, God, for these hearts and minds coming together. We realize and recognize, God, that we all have some work to do. But we thank you, Lord, that all of this racial tension is really pulling the church together. It should yes, pull the yes. church together. Amen. And we thank you, God, that we're not just sitting at home criticizing and complaining. Mm. But I thank you, Lord, that we are living out our faith this morning as men of God to step boldly into the culture, step boldly in the conversations to help bring healing and hope to our our cities yeah. and to our nation and abroad. Yeah. So, Father, thank you for this first conversation, Lord. We've got three more to go, and we just pray, God, that you will use this season to connect our hearts, connect our minds, but also connect the work that we need to do in each of our respective spheres of influence. Yeah. We are thankful and we love you, Lord, in every way. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have amen. a great rest of the day. See you next week, right here.